talk about ambivalence. Uh, would you rather be at the beach on a Sunday or at a workshop? You don't have to answer it, but just think about it. Uh, as I was driving up here and I see people on their bikes and people walking and people doing all kinds of things and I'm saying, Ruben's saying, what are you doing? Uh, I'm going to a workshop. Uh, uh, the gentleman we played, uh, we were, I'm going to do an exercise and we talk about ambivalence. Uh, I wanted him to assist me. Did any, does anyone know what, what happened to this wonderful right. classical guitarist? Right. Oh, there you are. So we, 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 got, we met each other, and uh, I want to do a little exercise before we begin. Um, okay, um, are we ready? We didn't get a chance to rehearse this very much, but last time I was here, one of my favorite ways of beginning a workshop is uh, James Brown. I don't know how many of you know James Brown. I think he grew up in Iran, or maybe he did, I didn't know, or you never knew in, in James Brown there. Maybe he had a different name there, but in America, he was known to be quite a singer and quite a dancer. Uh, I won't dance for you today, because uh, I think my belt is on too tight. But, we're gonna, but what we're gonna do is I'm gonna come out over here, I'm gonna just have to stand here, because and I'd like everyone to please rise, all right? Uh, and what we're gonna do is, thank you, this is a very compliant group, you know? And we're gonna do, we're gonna start out the, the, the workshop, again, continuing, we're gonna try to sing James Brown, and I feel good, okay? okay. One. I feel good, like, like I knew I would. I feel good, like I knew I would. So good, so good. Woo! I feel good. Let's go. I feel good, like, like I knew I would. I feel good. Like I knew I would. Whoa, so good. So good. Woo! Cheer it. I feel good. Yeah. 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 By the way, when I'm not making money as a psychologist, I do have a band and sometimes very bad stand up comedy. Okay. We go the next frame here. Okay. The foundations of motivational interviewing. Motivation interviewing uh, really goes back to Carl Rogers. When I was here last time, we spoke about Carl Rogers briefly. The force of life, inner drive to grow, develop, and enhance one's abilities. I think this is a very important starting point. It puts the belief in, in mankind. I, I'm going to change the word. I, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to say in, a, uh, individual. I'm going to say individual, okay? And that will be correct. Individuals. Uh, have the ability and have capabilities to transcend their situation in life. Empowerment model by Mike Reagan's, the recovery person-centered paradigm shift. It's getting everyone to think about that way. We are very used to, as I spoke about last time, a very, very kind of deterministic person's uh, disease model that this is what you've got, this is how, this is how, how best it's gonna get. And then there's the Ben self-perception theory we'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, Prochatsky is really the uh, foundation of motivation interview. Many people think of Miller and Rolnick, which we'll get to, and we're going to go through a lot of the trans-theoretical model of changes. Then there's Janice and Mann's decisional balance theory, which they uh, enhanced and borrowed from the Prochatsky the trans-theoretical model, and then Miller and Rolnick, who took this and really advanced it into an application in working with many kinds of issues that they were faced with. All right. The self, sorry, the self-perception theory by Daryl Ben, he was a contemporary of Leon Festinger who had a differing view of cognitive dissonance theory. How many people want to go to the beach right now? <laughs> okay, so I didn't, I, 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 uh, didn't realize I'd even say that in cognitive dissonance. This brings back memories of how young I used to be when I went to the New School for Social Research, which actually was founded by many people who fled Tsarist Russia to be independent thinkers because they were not, their, their thinking and their, it was repressed by the Tsar at that time, so they founded the New School for Social Research. And at that time, Leon Festinger was the individual who uh, was prominent in perception theory. And basically saying is that when you have two things confronting what to do, whether to go to the beach or go to a workshop, how are you gonna resolve that ambivalence and that discrepancy if it's going to happen and, and, and the processes? 
So Ben was one of his contemporaries, and he had an alternative view called an attitude change. People deduce their own internal states, like attitudes and emotions. One assumes the attitudes, beliefs, and internal characteristics of another by observing the external factors that reduce or increase the observed behavior. Basically meaning that we may end up borrowing our perceptions of how other people behave, and therefore we actually may take away our own ability to look at our own motivation and reevaluate it and transcend that and not entrap ourselves into maybe how other people behave. Uh, very uh, quickly that in the time of social research, uh, you notice I made the comment about compliance. I'm not going to go through the compliance uh, kinds of uh, research that were done, but that people would watch other people's behavior and that would strongly influence how they believe that's how you're supposed to behave. But we want to promote the individual, okay? Uh, the trans theoretical model, it's an evidence-based, known as TTM, evidence-based behavior change. It's a pro-change model of behavior. There are stages of change, change is a process, not an event. Change occurs through distinct stages of readiness, and we're going to go through those. Here's kind of the, the trans theoretical model. Uh, one of the things is that I'm very good at putting things, I'm, I'm very centered as you can see, so it's right, right over there. But because I come uh, from a family that I'm the least artistic, they tell me when you center things, that's not good in art. I don't know what that means, but so I listened to my wife and, and, and left it there, okay? But process of change starts uh, that you have a stage and you go through this decisional balance, self-efficacy. Can I make the proper decision? Can I do it? And then I start going through these processes of change. We'll go through that in a moment. All right? The transgender medical model, uh, it, it, it discusses change, developing effective interventions to promote health behavior. Um, just as a side note, we are moving uh, in our paradigm, uh, at least in, in the United States, to a more health behavioral interventions with individuals. We believe that because health is, uh, healthcare costs are rising so significantly, that in, in helping individuals ha have a better mental state, they're gonna be take better care of their uh, health behavior. The model describes how people modify behavior to acquire positive change. Okay. This is one of intentional change. The model focuses on decision making of the individual. It helps explain differences in people's success during treatment for a range of psychological and physical health, and it's been widely accepted in many modification techniques such as smoking cessation, alcohol abuse, weight control, medical compliance, stress management, and most of all, organizational change. Many people do not, uh, they, they don't think that they have the ability to come into an organization, or what we call in, which is for another uh, presentation, into the systems model, uh, and how do you go into a system and bring about change in a way that does not uh, you know, invite uh, too much resistance, and also you can take that organization, or that system, or even that country, through changes that promote uh, healthy behavior. <coughs> Core constructs of the TMR, the process of change, decisional balance, self-efficacy, and temptation. I know this may sound a little drab and boring, we may do the dancing again, but many people, when they uh, hear motivation interviewing, really don't know uh, that the TTM is the basis. And what you're going to get today, and if you need the, we can always send you the, the PowerPoint, is really almost a step-by-step -step process of how to walk through this. Decisional balance theory <laughs> compares potential gains and losses. There are two decisional balance measures, pros and cons, critical constructs and model, and model, and balance between pros and cons vary depending on which stage of change the individual is in. Uh, we were hoping to get you an uh, example of that. Uh, we'll have to send that to you as well. Uh, the decisional balance reflects the individual's relative weighing of pros and cons and changing. The decision balance scale involves weighing the importance of the pros and cons. I'm reinforcing that. We're going to go through the, each of these a little bit more. Self-efficacy, the other component of motivational interviewing from Prashansky and uh, Del Clemente. Self-efficacy represents the situation-specific confidence that people have that they can cope with high-risk situations 
without relapsing to their unhealthy or high-risk habit. This concept was adapted from Ventura's self-efficacy theory that, you know what, you have to be able to believe that you can do it. And that's one of the biggest challenges we have, that most people do not believe you can do this. And we all know that many of you have come from backgrounds that you did what many people would not would say, how did you do it? All right, so temptation. Uh, temptation is uh, on the way here, is going to the beach instead of here. No. Reflects the intensity of urges to engage in a specific behavior when in the midst of difficult situations. For instance, I want to go out and drink Friday night with my friends, okay? But I just got a DUI last week. <laughs> do I want to do that? But I like my friends, and when we're, I'm here with my friends and all these nice looking girls. I mean, I don't bring that up with my wife, but and I don't go out drinking, hold on. Uh, uh, so, so you're saying, well, do I go out drinking or do I go out and stay home and, uh, and, and maybe read physics at night? I don't know. Uh, temptation is the converse of self-efficacy. The most common types of tempting situations are negative effect or emotional distress, because that's we're going to want immediate relief. Positive social situations and cravings. I like the positive social. Yeah. So here you have the stages of change. Pre-contemplation, I'm not ready to change. And contemplation, thinking about changing, action, actively changing, maintenance, continuous support change, relapse, slipping back to the previous behavior. Now what's interesting, <coughs> can I just get the water I'm talking about? Uh, what's interesting about this is, uh, oh, thanks, I have it, thank you, thank you, I have it, thank you very much. What's interesting about these changes is that what they found, Miller and Rolnick ultimately, is they went to individuals and rather, you know, pretty much in the scientific world, we're kind of coming, we're, we're kind of looking into our own theory of how things develop and we're testing our own theories. What they decided to do is we're going to go to individuals. We're going to go to people who have a smoking problem, a drinking problem, whatever problem it is. And they asked them, how did you stop changing? How did you stop smoking? Well, someone gave me a lot of money. Well, it didn't happen too often. Uh, someone stole my cigarettes. I couldn't find all kinds. But, but basically, they described a process that they went through. And it wasn't hypnosis, although that may be helpful too. Uh, but they went, and this is the process they went through. They said, you know what, there's a point, I wasn't ready, I'm not, I'm not even ready to change. Don't even talk to me about it, all right? You know, like my wife says to me, well, you take out the garbage. <laughs> so I'm not ready to do that, you know, I'm just not ready to do it, okay? And then I tell, well, she says, you can take out the garbage, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it. She says, you better think fast. <laughs> so then I take the garbage out, and then I keep, now I'm taking the garbage out all the time, and guess what? I've had no relapse. I take the garbage out all the time like a nice fellow, and now I'm cured of that problem. But these are the stages that one kind of goes to, and we'll talk about them a little bit more now. Pre-contemplation, not ready to change. The individual is not currently considering change. Ignorance is bliss, okay? Unlike the Greeks, a little knowledge can be dangerous, but they're kind of parallel. People are not intending to take action in the foreseeable future, usually in the next six months. We look at six months. When they spoke to people who quit drinking, smoking, whatever the behavior they were doing, it took them six months from the time they decided that they're, they're ready. Techniques, you want to validate their lack of readiness. You don't want to say to them, you know, you want to say, well, you know what, you really need to stop smoking, you know, you really need to stop going out drinking Friday night. You want to say to them, you know what, okay, I can understand that you're not ready to, to stop drinking. Encourage reevaluation of current behavior, current self, uh, encourage self-exploration, not action. Explain and personalize the risk. Traditional health promotion programs are often not designed for such individuals and are not matched to their needs. Okay, and we're going to do a little role play. You know, uh, how much time do I have? Another five minutes or what? No. What? 10-15 10, minutes. Okay, so I better get moving here. Contemplation, ambivalent about not, uh, change, sitting on the fence, not considering change for the next month. Techniques encourage evaluation of pros and cons, reevaluation of your group image through group activities, and identify and promote new positive outcome expectations. So you're thinking about it. <clears throat> Preparation. Some experience with change are trying to change. Testing the water. You plan to act within the next month. Techniques encourage evaluation of pros and cons of behavior change, reevaluation of group image through group activities, identify and promote new positive expectations. You see how that follows everything while you're going through there. 
This is called darn C. It's an app. Well, actually, it's a good darn C. Okay. Um, yeah, my wife says it's yarn C, but uh, as you go through, it's preparatory change talk. Desire, I want to change. Ability, I can change. Reason, it's important to change. Need, I should change. I'm not telling the person you need to change. You say, I want to change. I need to change. Then implementing change talk, commitment, I will make changes. That's the C, activation, I'm ready, prepared, willing to change. And now I'm taking the steps. The active, this is action phase, the active work toward desired behavioral change, including modification of your environment, experiences or behavior have been taken. At this stage, people have made specific overt modification in their lifestyles in the past six months. At this stage, a measure should be taken against relapse, techniques help the individual on restructuring cues and social support, enhance their self-efficacy for dealing with obstacles, and help to guard against feelings of loss and frustration. Maintenance, here the focus is on ongoing active work to maintain changes made, uh, changes made in relapse prevention. Next, at this stage, people are less tempted to relapse and are increasingly more confident that they can continue their change. Techniques, that's a uh, type of excuse me, for follow-up support, reinforce internal rewards and discuss coping with relapse. Then we have the relapse fall from grace. Okay, it's Sunday, what can I tell you, Saturday, whatever. <laughs> Uh, in this stage is a form of regression to the previous stage, refers to falling back to the old behaviors after going through other stages. Regression occurs when individuals refer to an earlier stage of change. Again, the techniques are evaluate triggers for relapse, reassess motivation and barriers, and plan stronger coping strategies. How do people move from one stage to another? In general, people progress as they need a growing awareness of the advantages, the pros of changing outweigh the disadvantages the cons, the TTM calls this the decisional balance. You'll ask yourself why you came here today rather than to the beach or something else. Confidence that they can make and maintain changes in situations that tempt them to return to their old and healthy behaviors. This is self-efficacy, a strategy that can help them make, maintain change. The TTM calls these processes of change as well. Uh, in general, uh, okay, we'll get the next one. processes of change that are covert, and over it that people use to progress through these stages. Um, so they're, they're basically both, but I'm going to go through the 10 processes of change, as explained by Prochaski. <clears throat> one, consciousness raising. These are all things you can use. And use this, I use these every day. It, it gets to the point where my wife says, when I'm talking to you, you sound like all you do is motivational interviewing. You know, I will say, well, you do too. You said, if you don't do this, you're not getting dinner. So I get motivated. <laughs> Conscious and raising, increasing awareness via information, education, personal feedback about healthy behavior. Two, dramatic relief, feeling fear, anxiety, or worry because of the unhealthy behavior or feeling inspiration hope when they hear about how people are able to change to healthy behaviors. Three, self-reevaluation, realizing that healthy behavior is an important part of who they are and want to be. Environmental reevaluation, realizing how their unhealthy behavior affects others and how they can help more positive effects by changing. I get this with a lot of couples. <clears throat> Somebody's doing drugs, and I say, well, how do you think this is affecting the, your partner? <clears throat> well, I don't know. Well, what, do you want to know? I don't say, well, you should know. I mean, that's a lot of traditional therapists say, well, you don't know your, what your partner's feeling. And you want to say, well, do you know how they are? Have you ever asked them? Have you wondered how it's affecting them? And they say, you know what, yeah, I need to think about that. Do you love them? Yes, I love them. Well, do you think you could lose them if you do this? Yeah, do you want to lose them? No, I don't want them. We're creating ambivalence with them. And love usually what? Prevails, thank you. Uh, social liberation, realizing that society is more supportive of healthy behavior. Society, we are programmed to be healthy. That's what really people want. So when you know that everybody's in your corner, we're all supportive of you, okay? Self-liberation, believing in one's ability to change and making commitments, acting on that belief. This is so critical. Number six is extremely critical because if we don't believe that we can do it, then everything else, it falls away. <clears throat> I know that I'm running through this because of time. I thought I had more, but there was a psychi psychiatrist who wrote an article that 99% of people have poor self-esteem. Someone wrote back to the editorial, very upset. How dare you say that? The 99% of people... It's not possible. So he wrote back and he apologizes. You're right, 100% of people have poor <laughs> self-esteem. Okay. Helping relationships, finding people who are supportive of their change, uh, which is very critical. If, you're, if you've got anybody who comes into your office, 
If they're alone and they got nobody in their life, that's going to be tough. So you become their anchor in one way. Counter conditioning, okay? I'm not talking about air conditioning. Substituting healthy ways of acting and, and, and thing for unhealthy ones. I think that's a typo on my part. Reinforcement management, increasing the rewards that come from positive behavior and reducing those that come from negative behavior. Uh, stimulus control using reminders and cues that encourage healthy behavior. Uh, reinforcement management. Um, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I, I, I'm regressing to my days in, in the new school, so it was very research oriented. But I'll never forget taking my course in behavioral psychology. And how many of you remember your behavioral psychology? Anybody took behavioral psychology? Okay, okay. How about this? If I give you, it's your, it's your birthday, right? And I go over and I say, okay. Okay, here's your birthday present. Happy birthday. Thank you. No, no, you're not going to say that. <laughs> you're going to throw it back at me. You're going to throw it back at me. Let me tell you the most important thing in behavioral psychology and reinforcement. There are four kinds of reinforcement. I'll be very quick. I'm gonna, there's tangible ones. There's food. There's, you know, there's uh, doing activities, time with someone. Uh, it's, I'm trying to get that reinforced with my wife, you know, time with her, but we're working on it, okay? Uh, but the most important thing that comes with reinforcement management, what every reinforcer is, it's got to come with verbal praise. If you don't have the verbal praise, you lose everything. It's gone. It's, they, they throw it right back. When you say something, you know what, I'm giving you this because you are a marvelous person. I am so happy that I know you and I want to give you this gift, okay? Even if it's from the 99 cent store, it has meaning. All right? Coping strategy, choosing, cha there the first five, we just went through 10. The first five are classified as experiential processes and are used primarily for the early stage transitions. And those five stages we talked about, pre-contemplation going down. The last five are labeled behavioral processes and are used primarily for the later stages. You will all, we'll make sure all of you are gonna get a PowerPoint, okay? Okay, we'll, get, we'll send it to you, right? And choosing strategy of change. Try to get through this in time. Different strategies are most effective at different stages of change. For example, counter conditioning and stimulus control can really help people in action and maintenance stages. But these processes are not helpful for someone who's not intending to take action. Conscious raising is good for pre-contemplation. When we move on, that's why pro-change programs tailor feedback to individuals in stages matched to interventions. I've never seen a, a, a guard on the Lakers, that's five foot one. I mean, a, uh, a center. Anyone see that? Play center for Lakers, that's five foot one? I, I tried it, it didn't work. Uh, the uh, stages for evoking change talk. We want them to talk change. I'm not running for president here, I'm just talking change, all right? Okay? <clears throat> These are specific therapeutic strategies. They're likely to listen and support change talk in motivation interview. Number one, ask evocative questions. Ask an opening question, the answer to which is likely to change talk. Like, what would you like to do? Not, you know, you really should be doing this. By the way, I wish I had more. We got to get rid of the parents of that sometimes that we grew up with. The, 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 the parents, they're always telling us what to do, you know? You know, they're, they're, they're different kind of parents, but that's another time in itself. But that's what happens here. Explore a decision that asks for the pros and cons of both changing and staying the same. There's a decisional box, and you figure out, well, is this worth it? Is it not worth it? And you weigh it out, okay? Uh, good things or not so good things, ask about the positives and the negatives of the target behavior. <coughs> ask for elaboration examples. When change talk emerges, ask for, in what ways? Tell me more. Uh, we call it elaboration. What does that look like? You know? What was the last time that happened? Look back. Ask about a time before the target behavior emerged. How were things better, different? Look forward. Ask what may happen if things continue as they are. Try the miracle question. If you were 100 successful in making changes, what would you want? What would be different? How would you like your life to be in five years from now? You know, you're kind of, why is it called motivation interview? here? Anybody know why? Want to take a guess? <coughs> because that's what you're doing. You're interviewing the person. Everyone likes to be interviewed, M most people. Most people like to talk about themselves, okay, all right? We'll talk about dating another time. I'll talk about dating. Guarantee everyone to get all, any date you want after that lecture, okay? All right? Uh, I, I know I haven't got a date with my wife yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Query, query, I always bag on my wife, but she's like part of my program, you know. Query extremes. What are the worst things that might happen if you don't make this change? What are the best things that might happen? Use change rulers. You're going to see that on a scale of t from, should be one to ten. Oh, 
How important is it to you to change a specific target behavior? One, not at all important. Ten, extremely important. Explore your goals and values. Ask what the person's guiding values are. What do they want in life? Using values, card sort activity can be helpful here. Does it help to realize an important goal or value interfere with it, or is it irrelevant? Here, so it comes along explicit side of the negative side quote, and but perhaps, here's a way to say, perhaps blank, is it so important to you that you won't give it up no matter what the cost? It's called, come on, it's called explicit side with the negative status quote side of ambivalence. Ambivalence is, on the one hand, I want to do this. Two more minutes. Okay, I got a two minute warning. Okay, all right. How important is it for you to change? How confident that you can make the change? Yields a clear sense of readiness. Reflects two independent dimensions. What should I and how can I? And we're going to, goal is, I'm going to just go through here. Create cognitive distance. Where is one and where does one be? Um, okay, I'm going to just, we've gone through this. We'll just go through it quickly with the time. Each individual has a powerful potential of change. The task of the council, <coughs> counselor is to release that potential and facilitate the natural change process already inherent in the individual. Okay. All right. Empathy, respect, tolerance, patience. These are things genuine. Resistance occurs when experiencing conflict between the view of the problem and solution and based on the ambivalence of change. You want to empower, collaborate. Here's just reviewing what we've just done. Accept people as they are, recognize ambivalence, and change is normal. Encourage their positive self motivated statements. I'm um, just going to run through these quickly because these are some of the concepts. I'm going to get you the, because of time, I thought we had a little bit more time. The scalp, all right. Rolling with the resistance, hold on. Okay. This is the cost benefit scale, pros and cons. Um, it's kind of a little hard to read that one, the example of individual balance sheet. But this is basically, because of time, uh, I'll get you a, a good copy, everyone. Uh, I do want to read you something. Inventing a comfortable illusion. Isn't it strange? So this person goes to one of the employees. Isn't it strange that you have this dead end job when you're twice as smart as your boss? The, oh, hmm. the hours are long, the pay is mediocre, nobody respects you, your contributions, that you freely choose to work here? Hmm. It's absurd. No, wait, there must be a reason. I must work here because I love the work. I love this job. Well, he got him to keep his job, so he really can do that. I'm, I'm sorry we had to go through these frames quickly. I was going to give you this scenario. A major corporation has been experiencing a steady rise in employee absenteeism. You have been asked as a consultant to provide guidance addressing this major problem. How would you apply MI? What would, what would be your rationale? I wouldn't use this approach, by the way. That's why I gave it to you. Uh, you're right. Some remarks, everyone has a purpose, everyone has a mission, everyone has a special ability, everyone can be part of the solution, as everyone is part of the whole. We are all in this together, slogan from Virgin American Airlines, if you've ever been, used their restroom. <laughs> and it's never too late to self-motivate.